privilege, what a joy it is to come to the house of the Lord. On my way here this morning, I was thinking I get to be in God's presence at church, but we get to be in God's presence anywhere, anytime. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful blessing? Nothing can bless us more than the presence of God. So Lord God Almighty, we come to you today and we just want to say thank you. Thank you for being a God that rescues. Thank you for being a God that blesses. Thank you for being a God that loves. Thank you for being a God that delivers. Thank you for being a God who is almighty, all-powerful. Oh, when we just look at your handiwork in the skies and the heavens and the seas and this beautiful world that you have created. When we consider the marvel of all that you have made, we get just a brief, brief glimpse yes, of who you. you are, your mighty power, your majesty, Amen. your majesty. Praise. And Lord God, then your son, Jesus, oh, to save us when Thank we you. don't deserve it at all. Thank you. you could have washed your hands of us and yet you gave your life for Praise us. Instead of washing your hands of us, you had your hands pierced for us. So Lord, we wanna thank you for that. We wanna thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, minister to us today. Yes, Lord. Comfort us Hallelujah. today. Heal us Praise today. Yes, we need to feel Hallelujah. your power. We need to feel ministered to by you. Thank you that we have you. We welcome you. Reign, reign yes. here Thank you. at Hope Center of Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Isaiah 41, 28 says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he in increases strength. Even the youths ha shall faint and be weary and the young men will utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. He is the everlasting God. He reigns and he rules forever. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We give you honor and glory and praise. Glory to God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Say it again.
Lord, for all that you've done in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank, can you just say praise the Lord with me? Thank you, Lord. Oh, boy, that was pretty weak. Praise the Lord. Yeah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen, Hope Center. Boy, we are given an opportunity to walk into the throne room of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So when we say praise the Lord, let's shake this building. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Psalm 29 says, the Lord rules over the flood waters. The Lord rules his king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses them with peace. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the almighty, the omnipotent, he reigns forevermore. Hallelujah. Come on, praise his name this morning, Hope Center. Our God reigns. Thank you, Lord.
Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, the Omnipotent reigns. I thought he wanted to say something. But, you know, we're sort of switching around the songs. Yeah, be seated. Be seated. Be seated. You know, I was listening to the radio this week to Joel Olstein, and he kept talking about the fact that you are highly favored of the Lord. And you need to claim that. He said, claim that every morning. Just wake up. I don't know how you feel about him, but I, I like listening to him. It, you know what? It, it takes your attitude and lifts it up to something better. So every morning, wake up and say, no matter what it is, I'm highly favored of the Lord. This church is highly favored of the Lord. My job, I will be highly favored of the Lord. My children, my family, my life is highly favored of the Lord. And you know, sometimes we walk in fear and we don't even know it because we're too afraid to claim the promises of the Lord. God says that he has not given you that spirit of fear, even when you don't realize it, when you don't feel like you want to go out and witness, when you don't feel like you want to stand for the Lord. God has called you highly favored to walk in his power, his love, and a sound mind. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but he's given you power, and he's given you love, and he's given you a sound mind. You're highly favored of the Lord.
Bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen. Give God the glory. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen and amen. We know that our Christ is the true vine. And we are the branches. Amen. He would never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. That is a promise to us. The reading today is from Romans 3, verses 21 to 26. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just. And he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus Christ. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I'd asked Scott to do this song, and I didn't think he could, but he just told me he did. And I just really believe in my heart. I've been thinking about this all, all this week. And Psalms 512 says, For you bless the righteous, O Lord, you cover him with favor as a shield. Amen. So you are highly favored, amen, because that's what the angel said to Mary, that she was highly favored. Receive that in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah.
Thank you, thank you, worship team. Thank you for all of you being with us today. It isn't church without you. You make church possible. And we want to welcome all of those of you who watch us on the internet. I continue to hear from you and how much Hope Center Christ blesses you across the country, around the world. We are honored and humbled that God is using us in such a magic, majestic way. And he gets all the glory. We do it only for his glory, for him and him alone. And so we want to thank you. We do receive your gifts to Hope Center of Christ, and we are very grateful you make it all possible. And to all of you here in church, your gifts as well. They, they keep this ministry possible. We, our call is to bring the hope of Christ into the center of human hearts around the world. And, it's, and only Christ's hope is a hope that will never disappoint. When our lives are centered, when our hearts are centered on Christ, that's where we find true, true hope. Hope that will last for all eternity. That's our call to bring that hope to everyone within the sound of our, of your, our voices and our voices and the worship team as well. And to bring God glory. So welcome, welcome. In a moment, we will, will be receiving our tithes and offerings, and they are given to God and God alone. Now, you should have in front of you these orange cards. Most of you know them. They're easy to spot, and we invite you to get them out. If, you've ne if you need to update our co your contact information, please do so. We want to know how to contact you if things happen. We never know. We have special announcements. We want you to hear about it, and we do it through email. That's our primary way of communicating. It doesn't cost any money. We need to make sure. If you're not receiving our emails, make sure you fill it out. Make a note on that. Put it in there and say, I'm not getting your emails. And we will go back and we will check our database, make sure, and try to correct it to the best of our ability till we get it right. So let us know. And um, we ask all of you, we encourage all of you, all of you, to have that, to get, we're talking now in our message series on Jesus, getting to know you. We want to get to know Jesus. One of the ways we do that is through daily devotions, daily reading your scripture. If you don't know where to start, most of us pastors, almost every Sunday, we have a passage of scripture that we're preaching on. If you want to just reread that throughout the week, do that, if nothing else, or just go through the Psalms. Pick a Psalm if you only have time to get through a verse or two. That's great. Sometimes I've taken a verse, I've written it on a little sticky note. You've heard me tell this. I put it on the fridge, or I put it on the mirror. I put it somewhere where the, the Lord just speaks to me through a verse of Scripture. Sometimes that's my verse of Scripture for months, in addition to reading God's Word, but that's, that's mine. I take that and I internalize it. It becomes a a powerful scripture in my life. We encourage you to do that every single day. Daily devotions. I start. I've made them DD for daily devotions, as you can remember, and weekly worship. Worship. We know that nobody that you can't get here every week, but it's better if you can. The more weeks you're here, right here, where you can worship and feel with other fellow worshipers. That's a true, you get that wonderful communion with the Lord and with each other. So WW, weekly worship, daily devotions, weekly worship, and then monthly missions, M&Ms. You know, how many of you ever eat M&Ms? You know? And so that's what we think of. Think of those M&Ms. We're bringing sweet love of Jesus, the sweet spirit to our community through our missions, through our, our missions. And we do, we encourage you to do that once a month through ours, through our chili van. If you want to know more about that, Pastor Harold, you know him. He was up here reading scripture. Talk to him. He'll tell you how to do that. We also need help with our cleaning crew. We volunteer to keep God's house clean. If you want to know how to do that, you can see Susan or Raleigh. They'll help you find your place here with dusting, vacuuming, whatever. They come together in, in fellowship and keeping God's temple beautiful. We also need help with our setup and teardown on Sunday morning. So if any of you guys want to come a little early, I know that's hard for some of you, but boy, it can really, we need help. We need some more, some more muscles. Not that we don't have, the muscles aren't strong enough, but we just don't have enough of them. So uh, both before or if you can stay 
for a little bit afterwards and help with the teardown. That's another way that you can help serve the Lord right here. And also, we're going to need some help decorating for Good Friday and for Easter. So if you're interested in that as well, please let Susan know, and she'll take your contact information. So please, we want to make sure you, those, those are ways that you can do your monthly mission. We also encourage you to get deeper into God's Word through our, our Bible studies, midweek Bible studies. I know it's hard with work, and there are times, I can tell you all of us who, there, who are there every week, we all have times when we go, I didn't think I could make it tonight. I was so tired after working all day, or something else has come up, but we force ourselves to get in the car and go, and we're always blessed and refreshed by God's Word. We have the men's on Tuesday at 7 o'clock at the Lipsis House, and we have um, the women at Tuesday same night at seven o'clock at the Capea's house, and if you and then on Saturdays every other Saturday, Katie Carnahan does the young younger people. Um, not that the rest of us are all that old, but we are definitely older than young people. We're not young people anymore. We are not. And if you need the address to any of those places, Susan has them, and she can hand them to you because it's hard to remember. And I want to thank Susan for all you do, Susan, your wonderful, wonderful help. Can we thank Susan? Give her a big applause. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Also, if you don't know where to park your car, have we, haven't we all figured this out yet by now? I'm told not. But if you do not park out there, you'll get a ticket. If you parked out there, you won't. don't be embarrassed. Just get up right now and go and move your car down to the parking lot for the library. It's just down the block. It's very close. It's a lovely walk. It's a lovely parking lot. And uh, so even with children, and the children can be dropped off if you have little ones, babies right there at the house, at the parsonage in the children's section, and then you can go back and park your car because you don't want a ticket. That's not a fun way to leave church. You can lose your religion in a hurry doing that. My dad used to say he gave up golf because he was losing his religion when he played golf. So anyway, he said, I choose my religion over golf. Anyway, um, also we have some date changes. We have we try to keep them regular because it's easier to remember. But with the holidays falling at certain times, I want you to know um, and start making a note of it. Uh, we have coming up. We have Good Friday. It's going to be here before we know it. And Good Friday is I'm looking right here. April third. April third is Good Friday. That's on a Friday. That's easy to remember. Good Friday is on a Friday, I think. Susan? We have a lot of things over there. So we're, praise the Lord. She's fine. She's fine. She's fine. Probably a little shaken up. I know I am when I've taken my spills. Okay. Lord, we just ask right now that you'll give peace to Susan. Thank you that. We all fall from time to time, but we fall into the hands of a loving God that cushion us and catch us. Thank you, Lord. We thank you that you have your protective hand on each and every one of us all the time. Amen. Amen. Okay. Susan, that's the last time I thank you publicly in front of everybody. <laughs> We'll thank you privately in the future. <laughs> All right. So as I was saying, Good Friday is on a Friday. You can remember that, right? April 3rd. And what time at night do you think it's going to be? 7. I try to keep that always the same time. 7 o'clock right here, Chapman Chapel. And it will be communion. instead, it, Because Easter falls on a Sunday, just two days later, and that's the first Sunday of the month, we are not going to do communion on Easter. So we're going to do communion on Good Friday. We won't be having communion again until the first Sunday of April, May, April, May, May. Okay? Wow. We're getting through the year fast. So that's Good Friday. If you are interested, again, in helping decorate, we have candles, not real candles because of the fire marshal, but the LED candles that we will set out and make it beautiful. for good. It should be... I'm expecting it to be a very, very beautiful Good Friday service right here at Chapman Chapel. Um, Easter. We need your help with Easter. Not only with decorating, if you want to do that, we'd love to. Can you imagine seeing this place decorated with Easter lilies and other things? If God's giving you a vision for that, please see us. 
But I went ahead and I purchased these for you. These are my gift to Hope Center Price. And it says, hunting for more this Easter. Now, if you can see it, but there's little colored Easter eggs. It makes it look kind of fun and fresh and children friendly. And it says, find hope at Hope Center Price. It tells the dates and the time and the place. This makes it easier, I know, for you to invite friends and family and neighbors to our Easter service. So we have, I have 500 of these. That's what I ordered last year. So on your way out, if you want to pick up five, ten, pick them up and take them with you and start distributing them. They'll be here for the next couple of Sundays. But we only have, I think, two or three more Sundays before here in Easter. So pick them up today, if you would, and help us distribute those. And uh, let me check... That Sunday is, it's Easter Sunday. We will not have potluck that Sunday. We will not have communion that Sunday. They're being postponed till April 12th. So that's a change, and I want to make sure you hear that. We are having two services. We will not fit everybody in here on Easter with one service. This, it's too small, too cramped. We, I mean, we could, but it's not going to be comfortable. And people don't want to be scrunched in next to somebody they don't know. I know we're kind of funny that way, right? So anyway, we need to do two services. So we will keep them short because we have to get people in and out. So um, let me see. Did I get to do everything? Otherwise, I hear about it later. All right. Um, we are ready to now to accept our tithes and offerings out of gratitude to the Lord. Whoa, my goodness gracious. I just feel so much gratitude to my God, and I know you do too. So God, we come to you now with hearts overflowing. Oh God, you have given us pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. Financial, yes, but more than that, love and mercy and joy. Pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. You've given us your spirit, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. Oh, Lord, we just want to give back to you. This is our worship to you. This is our thanks to you. And it seems like the more we give to you, the more we receive. We don't do it for that reason, but it just seems to be that way. And we want to acknowledge you, and we want to say that you are a good God. You are a generous, generous, generous God. And we thank you for that. So use these gifts now for your glory to build your kingdom here on earth. Amen. As we continue to worship the Lord with our giving, we thank him for all that he's done all that he will do in our lives as we give to him. The Bible says, come before him with thanksgiving and praise. Hallelujah. We step into the throne room of Jesus, worshiping, giving him honor, giving him glory and praise. For he is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Savior of the world. We give him praise and honor and glory. Hallelujah. I see the Lord seated on a throne. I see the Lord seated on the throne. Exalted and the train of his throne fills the temple with
worthy. Hallelujah, because you are worthy. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. We worship you, Father. We worship you. Lord God Almighty, Thank you. you planted a word in Isaiah's heart. Isaiah, who saw your glory, who saw you seated on the throne, yes. you planted a word in his heart. I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Lord God, we receive that word today. We receive that promise. We have not seen, nor have we heard, nor can we comprehend the things you have prepared for us who bow before you, who give you glory, who worship your name, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Wow. Wow. I was in the other room praying, and they're singing this song. All of a sudden, I'm singing that song, and it was going. Worship time was wonderful. How are you doing? There were, is this going to stay there? Yeah. There were two gentlemen going for a walk one day, and they are walking along, and all of a sudden, they come across this pit that they hadn't seen before, and it looked huge, and it looked deep. And they're staring down into this abyss and they can't figure out, is there a bottom to this thing? You know, you think there's a bottom to this? I don't know. Let's find, well, here. And they saw an anvil. You know what an anvil is if you haven't watched Bugs Bunny sometimes. You know, the anvil is the great big piece of iron that, you know, is always get thrown onto somebody. So they find an anvil and they pick it up and they throw it into the pit. And they listen. Nothing. Not a crackle, not a splash, Nothing. Man, is there even a bottom to this pit? And they're, they're kind of scratching their heads and they're looking. That thing is really deep. Well, after a little bit, a goat comes running full speed, just running, 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 running. And the goat runs right between their legs and jumps into the pit. And they're like, what in the world just happened? And they don't hear a thing. Pretty soon they hear this, Dixie. Dixie, and here comes this old farmer walking up the street. Hey, you two guys seen my goat? Yeah, it was the strangest thing. A goat came, ran between our legs and jumped into that pit. And the farmer says, that's impossible. I had him chained to an anvil. <laughs> now, I tell you that story because that is an analogy of life. Whoops, I better not stand there. That is an analogy of life. Some of us walk through life feeling like we're chained to an anvil, and wherever that anvil gets tossed, that's what happens to our life, right? We're chained to an anvil with finances. We continually have financial trouble, and it burdens us. That's our burden. We're chained to it, and we can't shake loose of it. Sometimes it's relationships. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's uncertainty about your future, but you feel chained to something in life. Make sense? A lot of us walk through life like that. We feel like we're chained to something. And yet we read in 1 Corinthians 2.9, which is a repeat of Isaiah 64, it says it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Let's pray a minute. Lord God, today I pray a special prayer for everybody listening, that you will bring a breakthrough. Definition of a breakthrough is an advanced burst of knowledge. An advanced burst of knowledge. That their spiritual eyesight will open and they will see this world clearly. That as they leave here, they will walk in the natural world and they will walk in the supernatural world that is not seen. That the spirit of confusion will be lifted from their minds and from their hearts. That the spirit of confusion will be bound and thrown into a pit and never again burden one person listening today. 
breakthrough, Lord God. Praying for breakthrough. In Jesus' precious name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has a great quote. Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. I love that quote. I've lived with that quote a lot in my life. Every time I see that quote, I have to ask the question, are you a pessimist or are you an optimist? A glass half full or half empty type of person. You know, some people I ask that question, they say, I'm an optimist, I'm always an optimist. Things are always going to work out. Go up to other people, well, I think I'm a pessimist. Glass is always half empty, you know. I'm chained to that anvil, going down into the pit. I'm a pessimist. Things don't always work out the way I'd like to see them work out. Then you go up to other people and they're saying, I'm not sure if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I was kind of a pessimist yesterday, but today I'm in church, worshiping, feeling pretty good, you know. I'm like, I'm raring to go. But something's going to hit me tomorrow and I'll be a pessimist again. Amen? Amen? You're in one of those three camps. I think all of us at some time or another are in one of those three camps. So it's interesting how we live our lives. I don't have enough room on this pulpit, so I've got to move some things. I miss our glass pulpit. Sheila does too. Anybody who misses our glass pulpit, say amen. Sheila and I are going to say amen. <laughs> Just don't have enough room up here. Wow. But you know when I talk about being an optimist or a pessimist, there are really two sides of the same coin. Because you can flip them and one day you'll be an optimist and the next day you'll be a pessimist. They're chained to each other. Like that anvil going down into a pit. So read Ecclesiastes 7.13. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what God has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed one as well as the other. Let me read that again because that sounds like a pessimistic verse. Consider the work of God, for who can make straight what God has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed one as well as the other. As you consider that, you have to think that how many of us have gone through life and adversity has hit us and we prayed for breakthrough, we prayed for something to get us over that hump, whatever's in our way, to break that chain from that anvil that's dragging us into a pit. And answers come, but they don't look like what we think they should look like. God provides miracles. God provides an answer. God provides a way of escape. But in your natural eyes, it doesn't look like the way of escape that you wanted. It's not what you pictured the way of escape looking like. Making sense? Happens to a lot of us. Now, why is that? It really goes back to the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. The minute Adam and Eve took that bite of the fruit, of the, tr of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, everything changed. The idyllic world that God had created for them, suddenly their eyesight got set in the natural world and not in the spiritual. Right? When they were in the garden, before they ate the fruit, all they saw was the spiritual. Now, when they eat the fruit, all they see is the natural. We're still living under that burden. Natural man is living under that burden that we see things in the natural, which hinders us from seeing what God wants us to see in the spiritual. Now, that's a difficult concept to grasp because we've got to live in the natural. We've got to live with our neighbors and our friends and our colleagues, and we've got to live with Facebook and the Internet and all that other junk that's out there, good things and bad things. Right? When it's going great, it can elevate you tremendously. When it's going bad, it's like, why in the world did they ever invent that? Right? You hear of, you know, hazing and teasing. I mean, my, my heart breaks for teenagers today that are on Facebook and they're just being hounded by friends. Gossip about friends is no longer confined to the school hallways like when I was a kid. You got razzed in the hallway, but you dealt with it. You got face to face and the teasing didn't become so harsh when you're face to face. It's hard to get on somebody when you're staring them in the eye. Really easy to do it on the internet. 
really easy to throw mud on the internet because to the person throwing the mud, it's victimless. I feel good because I just threw that mud. On the other side of the coin, the person reading it feels horrible, right? That's the natural world. That's the natural world that we're having to live with with our eyes. What I'm praying for you today is spiritual eyesight, that you will see things in the supernatural world and not in the natural world. When you can do that, when that breakthrough comes, you live life differently. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. A couple of days ago, I was with, uh, yeah, Friday, I was with a pastor from Delaware. He's an evangelist, traveled a lot, traveled a lot with, with uh, my boss, Dr. Cirillo, back in the 90s. They did crusades all over the world together. I had never met this man before, Dr. Gary Whetstone. Some of you may have heard of him. But I got to sit with him, and I says, what was your breakthrough? Because he had been, and he, and he said his breakthrough came when he was already a pastor, already had founded several churches, and owned several church buildings that he rented to churches to, to help plant the church, doing crusades around the world. And he goes, but my breakthrough came after all of that happened. And I go, what was your breakthrough? And he goes, I was praying deep in prayer, just intercessory prayer one day, and all of a sudden... I had a vision. Christ gave me a vision. And he goes, I was walking the Via Della Rosa with Christ as he's carrying the cross. And all of a sudden, I'm carrying the cross with him. And I'm feeling the jabs and the pains and the stones and the verbal attacks from the people as we're walking those stations of the cross. When Christ fell, I fell with him. And then the vision continued and it got deeper. And he goes, he goes it got to the point where I was soaking wet. It was so real to me got to the point where he was at the foot of the cross and heard the spikes going in, could feel the thunder of the ground shake when the spikes were hit. And they raised that cross up, and he goes, I found myself at the foot of the cross, so much to the point where Christ's blood started covering me. And he goes, the vision became even more real and intense because the blood was so thick, it actually closed my eyes just completely covered my face. And when it completely covered my face, I heard the words of God said to me, you are dead. You are dead. And then instantly, the blood was gone. And everything was new. And he heard the words, you live again. Now, what that did for him was the newness that he saw was not in the natural. The newness he saw was supernatural. He saw the world differently. He no longer lived for what he wanted. He was dead. He died. He went into the grave with Christ. That's what baptism is. We go into the grave with Christ when we go under the water. When we come out the other side, we are raised to new life in Christ. We are no longer our own. We are purchased by his blood. When that happens, when that advanced burst of knowledge hits you, when you think about that this week, you will live life differently because you are no longer your own. You don't live for yourself. Go throughout all the New Testament. We don't live for ourselves. We live in Christ. What that does is allows you to put on spiritual eyesight because we're now his instruments on this earth. What happens to us is not important. I've said it a hundred times. When I get in this pulpit to preach, it's not about me. It's about God. People come up to me and say, great message. Well, thank you, Lord. It was his, not mine. I have nothing to do with it. I don't want you to see me. I want you to see God. If you don't see me, I've succeeded. Christ has succeeded through me. If you don't see me and you see him, perfect. That's the way it should be. But what happens with that, that advanced burst of, of knowledge that you just received when you die to self and you rise in Christ? Everything changes. Everything becomes possible. Everything in life becomes possible. Because you can't be disappointed. Whatever happens is because God is taking you, it's like a stock ticker. 
You ever seen the stock ticker? Look at a long-term graph. It goes up, down, up, down, up, down, like a lightning bolt, scratching like that. God takes you from here, and then he says, okay, because I need you to get you to this peak, Dr. Shu used to preach a, a message called peak-to-peak -peak principle. You get to the top of a mountain, and by the time you're huffing and puffing, and you get to the top of the mountain, you're like, wow, there's a mountain over there that's taller, but I couldn't see it because I was behind this mountain. So, but when I get to the top of this peak, suddenly I can see that mountain. But the only way to get there is to do that because I've got to go down into the valley to get to that one. That's the Christian walk. Christ will take you from here. If you're living for him, he will take you from here. Okay, to get you to this peak, sometimes you've got to walk here because... We've got to live with sinful man all around us. God is not the puppet master that's pulling the strings on every human being on earth. Every human being on earth has free will. They can choose to love, they can choose to hate, they can choose to become a pastor, they can choose to join ISIS. We live in a natural world. So because we are God's instruments... For him to deal with the natural world around us, sometimes he's got to take us from here, down to here, back up to here, back up to here, back up to here. So when you pray for a miracle sometimes in your life, God's taking you to that miracle because he's got to take you here to here to here to here to get to it. Amen? God did this to Abraham. He told Abraham that his wife was going to bear a child when they were old. They were in their 80s. When God told Abraham, you will bear a child, Sarah, his wife, laughed about it. She heard God speaking. She was in the tent. She's laughing about it. Guess what? She didn't bear a child for 17 years after that happened. But God made of Abraham a great nation. Now, in this world today, that 17 years in the United States of America in the year 2015 is an eternity because we live in a society of instant gratification. If it didn't happen, it doesn't happen five minutes from now, God ignored me. God didn't give me the breakthrough. He's helping that person, but he's not helping me. That person's on a different journey than I am. That person's on a different journey. Sheila's on a different journey than I am. Jim's on a different journey than I am. So when you're being used by God, he will give you the breakthrough. When you're sold out to him, he will take you to places that you never thought possible. It goes right back to... Sarah's going to come help me finish the message. <laughs> I had to give you a hard time. I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I has not seen nor ear heard the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Give you another example. When we back what, six months ago when we studied the book of uh, uh, Joshua, we talked about, go back to, to the book of Numbers. And the children of Israel have just crossed the Red Sea. They're in a celebratory mood. They've just, you know, spent some time under the mountain. They've received the Ten Commandments. A couple of months later, two years later actually, they're standing at the Promised Land, at the doors. God says to Joshua, send in 12 spies. Check out the land, have them bring back a report. What happened? Ten of the twelve came back with a horrific report. That land is filled with giants. Their cities are fortified. There's no way we are ever, ever, ever going to take that land. But Caleb said, he quieted the people and said, let us at, at once... Take possession, for we are able to overcome it. That was Josh, or Caleb's report. Let's take the land. The other ten are saying, you're crazy, to the point where the people wanted to stone Caleb because he was saying, take the land. God's given it to us. I have the faith that we can take the land. But the people couldn't see it. Their eyesight was in the natural and not the supernatural. What happened to Caleb in his great faith? You don't think he was praying in his tent night after night. God changed the heart of these people. The promised land you promised us is right there. I can see it. Let's go. 
get these sticks in the mud out of the, out of the mud, let's go. You don't think that was his prayer every night on his face, on his knees, every... It's not recorded in the Bible, but I can tell you that's what Caleb was doing. Caleb was a man of faith. But the people's hearts remained cold because all they saw was the natural and not the supernatural. They had natural eyesight and not supernatural eyesight. So what does God do? Gives all the people a big U-turn, including Caleb and Joshua and Moses, and those probably few that had enough faith to go forward, all of them got U-turned. God didn't, God could have taken the leadership and elevated them and had them crossed into the promised land. He could have taken the promised land with 15 or 20 people, if that's all the people that had faith. And he could have U-turned those that didn't have faith, the 2 million people, and had them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. It's not what God did. God did not leave those faithless people leaderless. If God would have separated the leadership out, those that had great faith, if he would have separated them out and left the others on their own, they would have died and every generation after them would have died in the desert. They would have been wiped out as a people. God didn't leave them leaderless. He U-turned all of them. So here's Caleb, here's Moses, Joshua, those with faith, among all these people that didn't have faith, and they're putting up with all of these people and praying to God, Lord God, be merciful. For 40 years they pray that. Lord God, lead us to the promised land. Turn their hearts, turn their hearts, turn their hearts. 40 years later, they're now standing at the promised land again. What happens then? This is where I get excited. After 40 years of dealing with junk and trash and all kinds of faithless people, they're now standing on the promised land. And what, is, what does Caleb say? My favorite words from Caleb. Caleb says, give me my mountain. That mountain that you promised me 40 years ago, he's 80, yeah, he's in his 80s now. I think he's 85, the Bible says. Forty years earlier, God had promised him a certain patch of land that had a mountain on it. Caleb's now 40 years older, standing there in his 80s and saying, God, you promised me that mountain, give me that mountain. I am still a young man. I am still a young man. Give me that mountain. Spiritual eyesight. It does not matter Caleb's age. What matters is his eyesight. His eyes are fixed on faith. They're fixed on God and God's plan and not his own. God wants me to have that mountain. Well, it took 40 years to get me there because I had to put up with all these other people, but there it is. And he's going to give it to me. And God drove out. Go through the story after that as they go into the promised land. You can read story after story after story. God drove out the enemy in front of them. When he finally had a mass of people who had faith, he didn't need two million people to, to, to get swords. He just needed them to have faith. Once they had faith, he cleared the path. They didn't have to fight, right? They had to march. They had to praise God. They didn't have to fight. God drove them out. Ah, that herd of soldiers over there that looks so nasty throws bees at them and wipes them, you know, sends them running. That's the way it works. Spiritual eyesight. When you have spiritual eyesight, time no longer matters. Time becomes irrelevant because I'm on God's time and I'm not looking at a Timex watch. Doesn't matter anymore. Time does not matter. Because if I'm on God's time, I'm going to stand here, Lord God, till you tell me to move. And when, you take, when I take a step... As Martin Luther King said, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. So God says to me, take a step. I'll take a step. Wow, it's kind of scary on this step. Doesn't matter. I got spiritual eyesight. I'm not seeing all the piranhas that are swirling around me. Then God say, take another step. I don't know if he'll tell you to take another step five minutes later or five years later. Or 10 years later. Wow. 
spiritual eyesight. God's timetable and not ours. Is this sinking in? Pretty quiet out there. You know? This is where to have spiritual eyesight, you have to go back to a message that I gave two weeks ago. Sheila missed. I have to give it to her sometime. Yeah, I'll have to get, get her the video. Where? What did we talk about? We talk about stomping out the past to receive the blessing. You can't get blessed if you're living in the past. Remember we talked about that? Yeah, yeah. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press on, Paul wrote. Forgetting those things which are behind. You can't have spiritual eyesight if your eyesight is looking in the rearview mirror because then you're looking on natural man. You're not looking on God's, what God has envisioned. It's a different way to live. Because when you live that way, you become, there's no way to be a pessimist. You can't be. You can't be. You can't be. We're, we worry about kids. I worry about my kids. What's going to happen to them in the future? But I, my spiritual eyesight is set on the Bible that says, raise your child up in the way she, he or she should go, and they will not depart from it. I claim that scripture. Now, I don't know how long it'll take my kids. I'm not singling them out. I don't know how long it'll take my kids to figure it out. They may wander in the wilderness for 40 years before they have their aha moment and spiritual eyesight kicks in. But God will give it to them. How long will they rebel from it? I'm not saying they're rebellious. I'm just giving you an example. That's where you have to have spiritual eyesight because you live differently. When people become adverse towards me, I find myself more often than not praying for them rather than fretting over them. I've got lots of obstacles. I'm trying to, with Dr. Cirillo, build 350,000 square feet in the middle of a dense valley in San Diego. You don't think that doesn't cause a little controversy with, what about traffic? What about this? All the neighbors. I don't know if well, I want the noise. I don't know if I want the dust. It's congested enough out there as it is. You don't think I hear all that stuff? I find the more pushback I get, I realize all of those headwinds means God's going to provide a breakthrough and I'm going to get to witness it. Don't know how long the breakthrough will take, but I get, to, I get a front row seat. Front row seat. I'll tell Sheila's story. I've, I've told her before, I love your story, of when you were a little girl and you are afraid of, of thunderstorms. And there was a thunderstorm one night and it was raging outside and she's hiding under the covers in her bedroom and her dad comes in, picks her up, walks her out onto the front porch in the middle of a thunderstorm, sits down in the chair and said, look at the awesome glory of God on display. You get a front row seat. Translate that to society. When you're dealing with people who are coming against you, adversities coming against you, you've got no money in your checking account, I don't care what your problem is, when you see that, the Bible says rejoice in all things. Rejoice in hardships, rejoice in good times. It says rejoice in all things. If you have spiritual eyesight on, when you see an empty checkbook, you say, wow, I got a front row seat to God do, for, for God to do something glorious in my life. Somebody's coming against you, fighting against you, railing it. Wow, I get a front row seat to how God's going to overcome this because I can't do it. Wow. And then throw your watch away. That's the worst thing about cell phones. They all have a great big watch on them, a big clock. And we're tied to it like an anvil. We're tied to it like an anvil. Doesn't matter what's going on in life. If I'm looking at the clock, well, five more minutes. I'm feeling more pessimistic. Nothing's happened yet. Five and a half minutes. 46, 47, 48. Where's my miracle? 50, 51, 52. Where's my miracle? Come on, God. 53, 54, 55. I'm going to explode if I don't get it. 56, 57, 58. There's a clock right here. I'm watching it. But that's how we live. Come on. Don't call yourself a Christian and live a pessimistic life. 
You demean Christ's act on the cross when you do. Put your spiritual eyesight on, and pessimism cannot live in your life. Come on! Come on! Come on! I see pessimistic Christians and I want to scream! What's wrong with you? The one that really drives me crazy is when they use God's edict as a weapon. I ain't tithing to that church because I don't like what they're doing. So they use their pocketbook as a weapon. God told them to tithe. He didn't tell them how he was going to use the tithe. He didn't consult them about how the tithe was going to use. He told them to give. If you're using your tithe as a weapon, keep your money. Don't want it in this church. Wow. Spiritual eyesight. Use your Christianity. Put the spiritual eyesight on. Get out of the natural. Get yourself out of the way. It ain't about you, folks. It's about him. Amen? Amen. Wow. I could go for a while, but I'm going to quit. We need this breakthrough. Spiritual eyesight. Father, I pray that something you put out today, as I went into the throne room of God today before you, I pleaded before you, Lord God, that you would give spiritual eyesight to these people today. Anybody who's listening, let them have a breakthrough, an advanced burst of knowledge. Wow. Give them spiritual eyesight. Get their eyes out of the natural and into the supernatural. Because, Lord God, I know they will live different lives. Yes, Lord. They will truly bear fruit. Because we can't live the way you want us to live and not bear fruit. It's not possible. Wow. Father, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to the cross. Because when he went to the cross, it was more than just sin he took out of our lives. It was complete restoration with you. That we can be in you, that you can be in us. Oh, Father. These people can shake the world with spiritual eyesight. They can shape neighborhoods and cities and communities and countries. They can shape the world with spiritual eyesight. Thank you. Give them the eyesight, Lord God, that when they say evil in the world, they understand that it's not people. We are not fighting against ISIS. We are grabbing Satan by the roots that is controlling ISIS and we are pulling those roots out of the earth like a weed. And we are releasing those imprisoned people called ISIS. We are releasing them from the hold of Satan. We are releasing, Lord God, we are grabbing a hold of the roots with our spiritual eyesight, we can grab a hold of the roots of yes. Satan. Yes. In Jesus of all of those people in the United States that are pulling yes. the United States of America away from you. Yes. To make it a more secular society, yes. Lord God. We are pulling those roots out because America belongs to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We are doing it around the world, Lord God. We're pulling out the roots yes. of demonic forces yes. that are causing countries to pull away from you. Yes. We are pulling out the roots that are causing a hatred towards Israel, your chosen people. You yes. said, whom, yes, I, Jesus name. whom you bless, I will bless, and whom you curse, I will curse. That was your promise over Israel. 
Lord God, we pull out by the roots those evil forces. Lord God, any, any bondage that anybody in here is under, financial, relationship, faith crisis, doesn't matter what it is, Lord, I pull the roots of that force that is holding people back and yanking it out of the ground. Anytime in your life, folks, when you see something happen in your life, you're not fighting against man. You're fighting against powers and principalities of darkness. Grab with your spiritual eyesight, grab those things by the roots and yank them out. Christ on the cross and his resurrection by the power of the Holy Spirit gave us that authority when we speak it in the name of Jesus. Lord God, breakthrough, an advanced burst of knowledge, spiritual eyesight. In Jesus' precious name, I pray these things. Amen. This is a heavy message. This is not Christianity 101. This is 401. (laughs) We've had you at 101, 201 for a while. This is 401. This is deep stuff. But you are now armed with something you never had before because you didn't realize it. You've had it because you've had Christ. But you now have an advanced burst of knowledge and authority that you didn't have before. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to sing, um, is there anybody here? But as we sing it this morning, uh, my heart really is resonating to what Pastor Jim was just speaking on about the problems that we're facing in the world today and how our country is being pulled away from the roots that it was, um, the roots that we had in God. But things can only change one heart at a time. So as we sing this song this morning, this may be a time to recommit. It may be a time that you've never committed uh, your life to Christ. You may be listening on, on the internet. You may even be in the Middle East right now and one of those ISIS members, but Christ can touch them just as well as he touches anybody else. And he is the only one that can solve the problems we have. So as we sing this, Let's give our hearts to Christ anew. And if you've never done that before, give your hearts to Christ this morning. Jim, thank you, worship team. What a powerful Sunday. I feel so blessed to have been here today. Um, what What a gift. Thank you, Jim.
you know this week I sent you a text and said, can you preach this Sunday? I started to worry about something I had committed myself to on Thursday and Friday. I won't get into that. I was a family um, obligation, a joyful obligation, but I was not sure what condition I would be in today. So more about that on another Sunday, maybe. I have to get permission from my husband first before I tell the story. Do any of you ever do that? Jim, do you get permission from Gretchen before you tell her stories? No? No, I don't either, but you know what? Then I hear about it later. Then I hear about it. Sheila, why did you tell that story? And you know, my dad used to tell stories about us all the time, too. So, anyway, it comes to the territory. But anyway, um, but thank you, Jim. Thank you. It was a blessing, just a blessing. So please stand for the, for the benediction. And as Scott said, you know, we all have to be ready. We don't know when the Lord's going to return. The Bible says he comes as a thief in the night. But my dad also taught me and, and that we should come to Jesus because we want to fall in love with him because of what he can give us in terms of out of gratitude, in terms of grace, in terms of forgiveness, in terms of a wonderful life here and in the hereafter, that we should fall in love with Jesus, not to come to Jesus out of fear. And I think there, there, you know, there are some, some pastors, their call is to call people one way and one is another way. But I always loved my dad's approach. And I, I know that Jesus is coming again. He has said he's coming again. He has said, I don't, and I'm, you won't know when that will be. But we want to know, we want to have things in order because we'll be better off because of it. The here and the hereafter. So, you know, if you haven't, you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, in our closing, I'm going to give another closing prayer. You can pray the prayer with us. If it's the first time you've ever prayed it, we want you to let us know. Let the pastors know afterwards. But Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for dying. Thank you for living. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. Thank you for life abundantly uh, here and in the hereafter. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness, forgiveness, for the freedom that comes with that forgiveness. So thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or for the hundredth time or for the thousandth time, it doesn't matter what it is, but you have made that statement and the Lord lives in your heart. What a blessed assurance. Now receive the benediction. And now, and now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace. Peace even in the valley of anxiety. Peace. May he give you faith. Faith that is unshakable even though you don't see any way through this valley. May he give you hope, hope that is unsinkable, hope that will be your breakthrough from anxiety. And may he give you love that is unquenchable, unquenchable love, even for the unlovable. Thank you, Jesus. Be blessed. The Lord loves you, and so do we. Amen. Amen. Well, what God has done in our lives today, hold on to it and take it with you. God is truly awesome. He reigns in majesty above and there's no other. We worship at His feet. His compassion and merciful. His plans for us are these. I'll bring you no harm. I'll get you tomorrow.